So good afternoon and welcome to our Cybersecurity Basics webinar. My name is Derek Spellman and I'm a communication specialist here with the Wisconsin Department of Administration. Just a few notes before we get underway today, um, as you probably heard when you joined, um, this webinar is being recorded so that we can make it available to folks who are not able to join us today. We will have a session for questions and answers after the presentation, but please, by all means, um, feel free to submit questions as you think of them via the chat function. And then finally, for folks who are on this webinar, um, yes, we will go ahead and email out a copy of the presentation and a link of the recording um, to folks who are participating today. So, and with that, um, I would like to turn it over to Michelle Reinen, an administrator with the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection who's gonna talk with us today about kind of some of the basic tips we can take to kind of help uh, promote cybersecurity within our business or organization. So Michelle, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Derek, and welcome everyone. I appreciate being invited to speak with you today, especially here in October, 2023, as the governor, uh, Governor Evers has proclaimed this Cybersecurity Awareness Month um, as part of the national campaign to uh, secure our world. So the to topic couldn't be more timely here. Um, so I am from the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. And specifically, we are, are, I am part of the Bureau of Consumer Protection within the Division of Trade and Consumer Protection. And I just wanna give you just a touch of what the Bureau of Consumer Protection does. So you know from what perspective I'm gonna be talking to you about cybersecurity basics for small businesses. The Bureau of Consumer Protection is responsible to enforce our state's consumer protection laws and also educate consumers on those scams and frauds that are out there. And as a result of those scams and frauds, consumers are impacted by identity theft as well as small businesses. And um, data breaches are certainly at the forefront and that's where cybersecurity in our lens comes in here with the Bureau of Consumer Protection. So um, I, I wanna let you know that as part of this presentation here today, you will be left with resources. Um, as you can see, I'm gonna leave you with our last bullet uh, being some resources as those takeaways, but I'm also gonna probably give you some action items as uh, whatever role you play in your organization. But we'll go over those cybersecurity basics and within those physical security, vendor security, things to consider for your organization, the threats, um, those scams and frauds uh, that are most likely to impact an organization, those next step action items as well, again, those resources. So it's really important what cyber criminals want. Having a basic understanding of that, that's gonna kind of lay the groundwork here. Personally identifiable and sensitive business information. That is what they are seeking. So it could be the tax identification number. It could be your employer identification number, registered agents, social security numbers and date of births that you may have on hand, business credit cards, proprietary business information email addresses, passwords, financial account numbers, third-party vendor info, phone numbers, customer and employee information. Any of this information can be used to manipulate your business and your employees or your customers. It can create that threat, that um, that cyber threat that exists. And also if they get their hands on it, it might be a way for them to access your system. So keep in mind as we go through this presentation, what kinds of data that you collect as it relates to what these criminals want? Because the more data you have, the, the higher target value you're gonna really be um, for a, a cyber criminal. Now, some of the leading cause of our cybersecurity threats are point of sale intrusions. Um, so it could be that credit card machine that you have if we're not keeping it up to date. Um, the web app attacks uh, that exist insider misuse you know how do you vet your employees I, I hate to say it but it could be something there physical threat or loss of maybe equipment and or data crimeware uh, card skimmers if you have unattended uh, devices uh, for taking transactions that could be a vulnerability but just plain old cyber espionage, which I'm not going to be getting into today to any depth. And then just miscellaneous errors. We are human. We are employees. We are vendors. And we are human. And miscellaneous errors can happen as well. So we don't want to forget about those and how we might be able to minimize those errors for your organization. 
So employee risk factors, you know, we are human. So there are risk factors to our organization that our employees can have, but there are going to be things we're going to talk about that you can do to minimize these. But an employer uh, could, an employee could have browsing habits that aren't great for your organization. Uh, maybe they uh, email attachments and how they're dealing with those or evaluating them. Just plain spam. And if that's being responded to, backups um, and, and how those are attended to and secured or, or taken. Unauthorized software, uh, just the ability to load that. Uh, USB drives, uh, what kind of parameters or provisions do you have around the use of those and whether or not they're personal or business issued. Social media, mobile devices, not shredding, um, those can all be employer risk factors. So um, we can combat a lot of this with training, education, awareness, and, and different security policies and practices, as well as developing policies and procedures uh, within your organization. So we'll be talking about some of that today. Next, here, I'm gonna just play a video. This is gonna highlight what we're gonna talk about and it's more entertaining than me talking uh, with you or at you. Um, so I will go ahead and play that for you now. Cyber criminals attack companies of all sizes. To reduce your risk, know and practice some cybersecurity basics. Start with your devices. Use strong passwords for all your devices, at least 12 characters with a mix of numbers, symbols, and both capital and lowercase letters. And set all your software to update automatically. This includes apps, web browsers, and operating systems. Next, back up your important files offline, like in the cloud or on an external hard drive. If your devices contain sensitive personal information, make sure they're encrypted and require multi-factor authentication to access areas of your network with sensitive information. This could be a temporary code on a smartphone or a key that's inserted into a computer. Also, think about how you connect to the network. Secure your router by changing its default name and password, turning off remote management, and then logging out as the administrator. Make sure your router is using WPA2 or WPA3 encryption, which protects information sent over your network so it can't be read by outsiders. Cybersecurity should be part of your business routine. Talk about cyber basics with your staff and have a plan in case you're attacked. Learn more at ftc.gov slash small business. All right, great. If you notice that last little part of the, the cartoon <laughs> that I just showed you at the bottom and some resources, though that's a sneak peek of all the different resources I'm going to uh, provide for you today. Um, and again, will be shared with you as part of the PowerPoint with website addresses to, to access that information, because this is going to be a lot to take in if this is the first time you're hearing some of these things. And some of what you heard in this video, I am going to repeat because repetition is somewhat our, our friend in this game that we play here with cybersecurity. So cybersecurity basics, the big overview. Uh, cyber criminals target companies of all size. And knowing some of these basics are, are putting and, and putting them in practice will help you protect your business and reduce the risk of a cyber attack. So first thing we need to do is protect files and devices. Update your software. This includes your apps, web browsers, and operating systems. Set updates to happen automatically. Um, that's going to be your best friend in this. And if you don't want to set them to automatically, you need to put in place a routine where you are checking for updates and then setting them for a particular time where it, it's going to happen quickly and not disrupt your business. Secure your files. Uh, back up important files offline on an external hard drive or in the cloud and make sure you store your paper files securely too. Require passwords. Use passwords for all laptops, tablets, and smartphones. Don't leave these devices unattended in public places um, because they can then become any, uh, any thieves' best friend and that can become valuable information uh, to be sold. Encrypt devices. Encrypt devices and other media that contain sensitive personal information. This includes, again, laptops, tablets, smartphones, removable drives, backup tapes, and cloud storage solutions. 
And then one of our favorites this month, because it's one of our key talking points for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, is use multi-factor authentication. Or you may have heard of it as two-factor authentication. You can see the initials there. You might see in readings, MFA. Um, Require multi-factor authentication to access areas of your network with sensitive information. This requires additional steps beyond logging in with a password. You saw in the cartoon, it's like a temporary code on a smartphone or a key that's inserted into a computer, or maybe you just have to trust uh, a device uh, through your other uh, device and make that connection there. Now, this might be something that some people are a little bit leery in using even personally, but the visual I want to give you is, you know, your password's your, your key to your front door. Now, this multi-factor authentication, that's the deadbolt system. So now you have a double lock. It's an extra layer. And, and cyber criminals aren't going to be able to access your information as easily now, you know, if they have the password. They need that other piece and won't have it. So this is something to seriously consider if you don't have it in place already. So next is to protect your wireless network. Secure that router. We saw that as part of the video there. Change the default name and password. This is a step a lot of people miss, especially at home. So depending upon where your business is operating out of, be, be considerate of that. You know, maybe you're operating part of the time out of the home and using that router. Well, change that default name and password. Turn off remote management and log out as the administrator once the router is set up. Use at least the wire protected access to encryption, WPA2. Make sure your router offers this WPA2 or WPA3 encryption and that it's turned on. Encryption protects information sent over your network so it can't be ready, read by the outsiders. Um, and we've already discussed here the, the MFA. And then also those requiring those strong passwords. You know, what is your policy going to be? And then don't forget to require that they be changed on some type of routine basis. Um, a strong password, for reference, can be at least 12 characters that are a mix of numbers, symbols, capital and lowercase letters, punctuation. Never allow the system to reuse passwords and don't share them on the phone and text or by email or give them away in any way, shape or form. Limit the number of unsuccessful login attempts is another parameter that you can put in place and limit password guessing attacks. I mean, by putting that limitation in there, you really are putting a, a clamp down on that guessing game. We're going to talk about training all staff, you know, create that culture of security by implementing a regular schedule of employee training and, you know, indicate what that includes and, and refresher courses as well. Update employees as you find out about new risks and vulnerabilities. And if employees don't attend, some companies consider blocking their access to the network until that they have taken the training. And then the other step of the basics is to have a plan. You know, know how you would respond to a situation. Um, how are you going to respond to a cyber attack? Uh, what's your internal plan or what vendor do you need to go to? Um, you want to have a plan for saving data, still continuing to operate your business, notifying customers if you experience a data breach, and how you would even recover data if your data is compromised or you are locked out from it. So getting into some specifics about the basics. So, we, we, you know, I just went over a whole lot of basics on the cybersecurity plan, and now we want to get into the actual physical security. So lapses in physical security can expose sensitive company data to identity theft, uh, which um, very serious consequences. And some examples of this are an employee accidentally leaves a flash drive on a coffee table. You know, maybe they went to a coffee house to... To, to finish a report or something. And when they return hours later to get it, the drive with hundreds of social security numbers saved on it is gone. Now, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna respond? Another employee throws stacks of old company bank records into a trash can um, where a criminal finds them after business hours. Maybe not your method of disposal there, but that's happened. And a burglar steals files and computers from your office after entering through an unlocked window. So these are all things that have happened to different individuals and companies. 
Um, so they are not just hypothetical situations. How would you respond if this happens or what are your uh, policies, procedures in place? So protect equipment and paper files, store them securely. Does that mean a locked room or maybe a locked file cabinet? Limit access. Does everyone in your organization have access to that? Now, your organization could be one person, five people, maybe it's 45. But how are you going to allow access to the information? And again, go back to that first slide or that second slide where I indicated what the cyber criminals want. That's the type of limitation we're talking about, that sensitive data. Who are you going to allow to access that? Send reminders um, about your policies and procedures as it relates to protecting equipment and paper files and keep stock, that inventory, keep track of that access, keep make sure that as an employee changes roles within an organization, you're limiting and changing their access. Um, you're verifying that uh, lockout systems are working or the cabinet, the file cabinet you're using, the lock doesn't break, but you're, you're keeping stock of things. And then protect data on your devices. We talked about limiting login attempts, um, encryption, as part of your network system. Um, it may be part of your email. Using that multi-factor authentication and then making sure that those passwords are complex. So the other part of the, the basics and breaking it down is really the vendor security. Um, you're wearing a lot of hats if you're a smaller business and you have a lot of roles to play. Um, so maybe you outsource. Uh, different portions of the work within your organization. You might outsource the human resources. Maybe you outsource the accounting. Maybe you outsource the, the, the IT function um, within your organization. But there are things that you need to consider with any vendor that you have. And this could be janitorial services as well because they're going to have access to your building there. So, um, Make sure that the vendors are securing their own computers and networks if that's the type of work that you're asking them to do for you. An example is what if your accountant who has all the financial data loses their laptop or a vendor whose network is connected to you gets hacked. So what's the result? Your business data and customers' personal information could end up in the wrong hands and that's going to put your business and your customers at risk. So that's why vendor security becomes so important here. But monitor the vendors. So once you have the agreement, which you've read through thoroughly, put it in writing. I mean, make sure everything you've discussed and they say they are going to do is part of your written agreement. Verify compliance. You might have a three-year agreement or a five-year agreement. Don't just wait till renewal time to go through and verify compliance. Do so on a regular basis. And then make changes as needed as your organization grows or maybe as the services you're asking them to um, participate in, expand, or their organization changes. Make changes to your agreement as needed. And then safeguard your business. Control their access um, to what it is they need in order to conduct the business you need them to. Secure your network as well, again, limiting that access and making sure that you have a secure system in place. And again, requiring that multi-factor authentication, that two layers to access things of your vendors. So the next thing I wanna talk about here are threats and scams. Um, here we have uh, four different scenarios that I'm gonna run through. Um, tech support, uh, phishing and, and billing, ransomware, and business email compromises. So these tend to be the leading cause of employee risk factors as it relates to being scammed and being vulnerable to outside. And, and this is an area where consumer protection really um, can help with education. And so you'll see that we become a resource for your organization and training as well. So tech support scams. Um, this is the, again, the first one. You get a phone call, a pop-up or an email telling you there's a problem with your computer. And often scammers are behind these calls, pop-up messages and emails. They want to get your money, personal information or access to your files. And this can harm your network and put your data at risk and damage your business. So 
specifically how the scam works. The scammers may pretend to be from a well-known tech company such as Microsoft, and they use lots of technical terms to convince you that the problems with your computer are real. And they may ask you to open some files or run a scan on your computer. And then they tell you that those files or the scan results uh, show a problem, but really there just isn't one. And you may have heard this before because this is certainly a scam that happens at individuals' households as well. Um, but the scammers then ask you to give them remote access to your computer because they're there to help. I mean, sure, they called you to let you know there was a technical problem, right? Um, when you give them remote access, this lets them access all the information stored on the device or even the network if you are connected to it. So um, they may also then take this a step further and try and enroll you in really worthless computer maintenance or a warranty program. Um, and that could be a vulnerability if you don't inform your employees how you may outsource that service. And so they may think that that's something the company or organization needs. The scammers could install malware that gives them access to your computer and sensitive data like names and passwords. So they could also ask for credit card information to bill you for the phony services that they are providing at that moment in time, as well as trying to sell you. Um, they could also direct you to a website and ask you to enter credit card, bank account, and other personal information. So the one way you can protect your business, if a caller says your computer has a problem, just instruct your employees and, and yourself <laughs> to hang up. A tech, support, um, a, a tech support company just isn't going to call you out of the blue and let you know you have problems. That's something you tend to discover on your own. Um, so be cautious that you don't uh, fall for the fact that these scammers often spoof phone numbers, making it look like it's local or legitimate. They use that fake caller ID information to put more trust into their scam and make it appear as though they are a local business. The other way that this support scam can come is through pop-up messages. As mentioned, ignore those as well. Some pop-up messages about computer issues are legitimate but that's where you do want to talk to your tech services. Um, but don't call phone numbers that are listed or click on links that appear in pop-up messages warning you about computer problems. And again, if you are worried about a virus or other threat, call your security software company or whoever your internal IT person may be um, and, and have them research that problem. All right, so then we move into phishing schemes here. And about 90% of all cyber attacks begin with a phishing scheme. So this is where there is great vulnerability here. You get an email that looks like it's from someone you know. It seems to be from one of your company's vendors and asks that you click on a link to update your business account. So the question is, should the employee click the link? Maybe it looks like it's from your boss and asks for your network password. Should you reply to that? In either case, no, you should not respond. Um, these are likely phishing attempts, but both cases are gonna put an individual on edge and question all the training that they've received as to whether or not they should click. A vendor asking for the information and it could hold up a job a boss asking you to do something, those are things that are will always put a, an employee in question um, as to what they should do next. So how phishing works, you get that email or text message and then it seems to be from someone you know, that's the general scheme and it asks you to click a link or give that password. Maybe it's a business bank account or some other sensitive information and it usually looks real. These things are, are vetted pretty well. Um, you might be able to spoof logos um, and, and make up fake email addresses. These scammers do that pretty often. You can sometimes hover over and see that they're not actually connected to the organization they say that they're coming from, but you again need to be careful that you're not clicking anything when you're doing that hover. So scammers definitely use familiar company names or pretend to be someone you know, because that again is gonna add that legitimacy and urgency for you to respond. 
the message is pressure you to act right now um, because if you don't have time to think about it, you won't remember all that training. So what happens next is if you click on that link, that uh, scammer could easily install ransomware or some other programs that can lock you out of your computer or maybe even locks the organization out of their data um, and the entire company network. Um, so be cautious that you don't click any links there. What you can do before you click on a link or share any sensitive business information, check it out. If the boss has sent you an email saying share the password, that's time to pick up the phone and call the boss and say, did you just send me this crazy email asking for the password against company policy? You know, you know, that's the time to make sure you're making contact. If the vendor has sent an email asking for all the account information and it's not your normal process or procedure, you call the vendor and ask what's going on as to why they need this information and did they just send that, that email to you. Um, Talking to colleagues might help figure out a request as to whether or not it's real or a phishing attempt. Um, again, picking up the phone and needing to confirm that who's ever contacted you really needs the information that they're requesting and what they need it for. Ways to protect your business should you fall victim to a phishing scam is back up your data. Regularly back up your data and make sure those backups are not connected to the network. That's going to be a key. That way, if the phishing attack happens and the hackers get to your network, you can restore the data. So determine at what frequency you want to be doing those backups. Um, is it a nightly thing? Is And so if that um, situation were to happen at noon, you'd only lose maybe four hours worth of data. Is it Weekly, is it monthly? How much data can you maybe afford to lose in there in that frequency? Um, keep all security up to date. Make sure you're doing all the patches, um, updating those operating systems uh, and, and get those latest patches and updates in place. Look for additional means of protection like email authentication and intrusion prevention software. Um, set them to update automatically on your computer and on mobile devices. Maybe you have to do that manually. Alert your staff. Keeping employees informed is um, imperative so they know about the different attacks you might be fending off, the latest scams that are circulating out there. Network with other companies and organizations in your business area, maybe through chambers of commerce or other associations so you know the attacks that are coming your way towards your industry. And then uh, always, again, be open to sharing information and deploying the latest safety nets. Ransomware. So ransomware continues to cause losses to Wisconsin businesses, but it's not at the rate that it did in 2021. The top victims by incident numbers in Wisconsin during 2021 were in the manufacturing area, financial services, and professional services sectors. For 2022, um, it was more professional services, manufacturing, and nonprofits, those smaller base business. Um, as the top tier groups have focused elsewhere, those criminals, um, we're seeing that wider variety of lower tier groups coming in and conducting attacks against targets of opportunity. So those cyber criminals have really shifted their viewpoint um, because they understand that the smaller businesses may not be in a position um, to patch their networks quickly. They may have in place weaker password practices and leave remote access ports open to the internet unprotected. Um, and so they are starting to bear the brunt of the ransomware attacks. So again, the best way to combat this is security, training, and um, those backups, making sure that you have that, should you fall victim to a ransomware attack, that you can recover. And again, eliminating those bad password practices if they exist within your organization, closing those remote access ports, um, and then make sure that you are patching your networks, doing those updates. And the final one that I'm going to go through today, um, by all means, not the last, I'm sorry to say, 
uh, is business email compromise scams, uh, those imposters uh, emails that are out there. So as scammers set up an email address, it could look like it's from your company. And then what happens is the scammer sends out messages using that email address. So very similar to a, a phishing scheme, except um, they have gone ahead and set up e these email addresses that look like they are from your company. Um, it, it Again, it is a form of spoofing, that misrepresentation, and we usually see it in phone lines, but it certainly happens with email addresses. Um, and scammers do this to get passwords, bank account numbers, or to get someone to send them money. So very common themes. I know I sound like I'm repeating myself here. When this happens, your company has a lot to lose. So customers and partners might lose trust. Um, they could take their business elsewhere. And in addition, your business could lose money in responding to the attack as well as from the lost relationships with your customers. So this, uh, the BEC, Business Email Compromise Scam, remains a significant cause of financial losses to Wisconsin businesses. Um, it can come in a couple of different forms, focus either on employee payroll or impersonating a customer or vendor. The employee payroll stuff tends to be smaller amounts, just so you're aware, because this scam typically goes one to two weeks and is for an employee's pay and then it's discovered. But then there's the customer vendor impersonation aspect, and this tends to be significantly higher dollar losses as those scammers focus on on industries like construction, real estate, where those purchases are significantly larger and the billing cycle is a net 30, 60, or 90 days. And that gives them more time for a company to discover the losses. And so the best defense here isn't actually a cyber defense. It's not actually getting rid of those password behaviors or, or closing a, a loop there. It's about putting in strong processes. It's a process related. So any request to change a bank account must be authenticated to the requester through a trust channel. Um, that's never going to be the phone number listed at the bottom of the email. It's going to be in person, a call to the company's main published number or something, but it's really going to be um, process and procedure related and making sure that those are uh, followed. So the next thing I wanna mention are these action items that I can leave you with. I gave you the doom and gloom side and how the attacks happen and what they're going after. But now what can you do? What action can you take against all of this? And so um, one of the next steps is to minimize the risks. And, and that is really to go ahead and protect the personal information, that sensitive business information that you collect. And step one is to take stock, evaluate um, what you collect. Why do you need it? Why do you collect it? How long do you keep it? Do you keep it beyond the necessary time frame that you need the information? And so then you need to consider as part of that taking stock, who has access to it? How is it stored and secured? Again, exactly what are you collecting on any and all forms or um, through any data that you have and where is it stored? Um, is it paper? Is it electronic? Is it with a vendor um, or a third party, other third party source? And then as well, scale down. This is your opportunity to say, when you do that inventory and identify 12 pieces of information you just collect because the form was standard and you're using it, but you don't need it, create a new form and get rid of those 12 pieces of information if you don't require it. Then lock it and pitch it. Look at your security, um, evaluate your training surrounding that security and your practices. Um, go through and evaluate your contractors a look at the agreements that you have and the training that the contractors you uh, work with uh, receive and look at your other service providers as well. Um, make sure that they are following the same level of security that you want for your organization. And then 
also plan ahead. Um, this involves recognizing warning signs as well as creating a response plan. So planning ahead is knowing how you're going to determine what happened should something happen or when something happens um, to your organization. What data is involved? Again, having your inventory list of the data you collect will help you evaluate and help you plan for how you will determine which data may be compromised in a situation and you know, analyze how many individuals are impacted. Planning ahead saves you money. Even though it, it takes time upfront, it will minimize the impact to your customers, your business, and your employees. Then we're also gonna ask you to evaluate your options, train employees, and recognize those warning signs. So evaluating your options. Um, you know, recovering from a cyber attack can be costly. Um, and one thing I wanna mention here, or have you consider, you know, evaluate your options around email authentication. We've talked about that. We haven't hit on cyber insurance. Usually when talking to organizations, that becomes a pretty um, popular question. Um, so cyber insurance is one option that can help protect your business against losses resulting from cyber attacks. But if you're thinking about cyber insurance, discuss this with your agent and what policy would be best for your company's needs, including whether you should go with first party coverage, third party coverage, or both. And some general tips to consider here are what should your cyber insurance policy cover? Um, you know, should it cover data breaches, cyber attacks on your data held by vendors or other third parties? Um, cyber attacks uh, like breaches of your network, cyber attacks that occur anywhere in the world. It's going to depend on the scope of your business and your uh, organization and how you interact. Um, you'll also want to consider if your insurance will provide you with a, def uh, you know, and, and defend you in a lawsuit or regulatory investigation provide coverage in excess of any other applicable insurance that you may have. Um, maybe you want to consider if it's going to offer a breach hotline that's available every day of the year at all times. Again, the scope of your organization and your customer base and what you do needs to be a factor um, in whether or not those are things you need your insurance to cover there. Um, let's see, other things uh, to evaluate your options is to, should you hire a web host? Is that something you need to outsource in order to be sure there's security there? Um, how will you secure remote access? Evaluate your policies and procedures against this. What do those look like? And are they a standard for your industry or are they unique to your organization and what you're doing and how up to date are they? Um, did you create them when you started your organization, but now you've changed things in the last three years, but there's never time to update the policy and procedures um, and, and train people on it. You just do it on the fly but now's a good time to evaluate and get that all documented and make sure it reflects the latest best practices as it relates to cybersecurity. And then follow through on the training plans for the employees um, and your, your vendors uh, and third-party outsourcing. And so again, training employees. I think I've said it plenty of times today. <laughs> Um, let them know what your cybersecurity practices are and your procedures. And, you know, things as simple as shredding documents. If you do receive paper documents or print out a form from the digital record, making sure that that's not just thrown in the garbage can when you're done, when it contains uh, personally identifiable information, making sure that there is a shredder there right by the copier or someone's desk if they're handling a lot of paper. Um, making sure that when you do uh, minimize your files and you decide it's time to get rid of them, that you are erasing the data correctly to be sure it can't be retrieved. Um, 
And that goes to when you're replacing devices as well, that you are cleansing them appropriately. Train employees on the response plan on reporting what they may see to be sure there's an environment free to indicate that there are warning signs or that they made a human error. Um, maybe they made a mistake in creating that culture and environment where they can come forward without feeling um, that there will be great punishment to them for the air so you can respond and deal with it. Training them on scams and threats, uh, especially the latest ones that are circulating within your industry, and again, those warning signs. So how do you train them on the warning signs? You need to recognize them. So of course we have those here. Um, you might see unauthorized debit and credit charges. So your financial person will wanna be paying attention to that as well as if different individuals have credit cards within your organization. Um, business email compromise attempts, we went over that scam. Unsolicited change of a registered agent. That one can be uh, harder to recognize, but that's someone who's trying to uh, redirect contact for your organization from outside parties. So you definitely wanna pay attention to that. Business computers and phones are infected with ransomware, malware. Um, fraudulent business loan applications in your, in your organization's name. Someone is trying to impersonate you and redirect funds. Bill collectors are calling. So the previous bullet may have already happened. And then you are denied credit. Again, um, someone may have already uh, compromised your, your credit rating as an organization um, and, and redirected things. So those would all be warning signs you wanna pay attention to um, and really dig to the bottom of. Now, before we get to the questions, we, I just have a couple more slides with these resources for you. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC Cybersecurity for Small Business is a great resource. They have uh, little modules I'll show you on the next slide that can help you train employees um, so you don't have to create that training yourself. The Federal Communication Commission, 10 Cybersecurity Tips for Small Businesses, a lot of what I've repeated, but is available for you. Um, the 10 are train employees and security practices, protect information and computers, provide firewall security, create mobile device action plans, make backup copies, control physical access, secure your Wi-Fi, limit employee access, password authentication, employee best practices on payment cards. So some good reminders there. And then we have the NIT Small Business Cybersecurity Corner for you. Again, a nice small business resource on best practices. And then the National Cybersecurity Alliance, Small and Medium Sized Business Resources, um, another great resource. And here are, is from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, you can see how it's a guide all within cybersecurity. There's quizzes. There's materials, there's video series similar to the one I showed earlier, um, and a guide for employers. So it's a nice friendly resource uh, for, for you to access. Um, and then I mentioned DadCap would be a resource for you. You can request a presentation to help train your organization, your employees on scams, on general consumer protection, on these cybersecurity basics. Um, identity theft and privacy protection for themselves and your customers or your employees. Um, but, but we are a free resource for you as well. So give us a call or go to our website to request that presentation. Um, and we also have them at libraries. So you could send individuals or maybe through a, a larger group, an association or a chamber of commerce, we'd be available. And then we also have a, a federal resource, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, part of Homeland Security um, is a, a great resource if needed as well. Um, you can see some in contact individuals, some cybersecurity advisors that service Wisconsin and some protective security advisors as well, but they um, help, uh, with known exploited vulnerabilities catalog and, and can give you what's circulating. 
there's a, a place to go where you can get alerts and advisories. So the way to stay informed, they can do assessments based on different businesses and organizations. So it's another good resource you're going to want to take a look at to see if it would be appropriate for your organization. And finally, because I could only cover a little bit in a small amount of time to get you all thinking about this, um, the Governor Cybersecurity Summit is actually next week. So this webinar is perfectly timed. You can still register and attend this event. It's Monday through Wednesday, Monday being women in cybersecurity. And I think Wednesday is a half day. So um, a, a great event for you to attend. Lots of resources there, good workshops. I take a look at the agenda. Um, I'll be there learning more. Our, our state's... Um, cybersecurity response team will have a, a presentation as well. So something else for you to dig in deeper and, and create considerations for your organization. So there's our contact information again. And with that, I leave it to questions. I know we've got, gone through the chat and I didn't monitor that because I wanted to get through this to make sure we could get to all your questions. So I think Derek's gonna take it away. <laughs> yes, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. That was a lot of great information. Um, so, um, we got a, uh, few questions. Um, one of them was about the, uh, Pat's, the, uh, suggestion for, um, what's a good length for a password. And I, I saw some chat action there. And as I recall from the presentation, um, it's at least 12 characters. And, um, that is a, a pretty similar standard that I've seen, like for the industry as a whole. So that's one question. Um, the other question is, um, is there a resource available to evaluate to evaluate cybersecurity insurance? And goodness, so could you repeat that? Oh, okay. So the first one, what's a good length for a password? Yeah, 10, 10, 12 characters is what I said during the presentation. One thing we're talking about in addition, if your organization allows for it, are passphrases. You know, consider it a combination of words and letters and symbols and in upper lower case and punctuation and things, but kind of a passphrase is how we're talking for personal passwords. And then there's organization ones as well. So the standard I've seen is 12, um, but 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 think how you're going to set that up and not reusing it by just adding a number each time. Um, that's going to be the other thing is cycling through. Now, evaluating insurance. Um, that's going to be tougher. Uh, you'll probably want to look at some different industry standards there. I did go through a, a number of considerations uh, for, for what you may have um, in insurance. The Office of Commissioner of Insurance is our state's overall insurance uh, watchdog, if you will. <laughs> they are a regulator for that. They, I, I don't know if they specifically have a fact sheet on cybersecurity insurance, um, but I got my information on considerations from the Federal Trade Commission. So going to that uh, website link that I had at the end of the PowerPoint for resources, ftc.gov, and going to that small business sector with cybersecurity, they will have considerations and questions uh, for insurance. And again, talking with your agents, agent and comparing your business to these packages, what's going to be appropriate for you. And um, we did get a request to drop um, some of the links in the chat, I think from one of your slides, which we've gone ahead and done. Um, looks like we have a uh, question that's coming in is, what do you suggest for maintaining a password list? Um, if you're talking for you as an individual because of all the places you have to log, some consider password managers, you know, different apps, but then you need to evaluate that app to make sure you've read its privacy policy and then secure the device where the app is located to be sure that if you lose that device, someone can't get in and then have the passwords to get to all your different um, accounts that you have. And so um, as far as maintaining a password list, I think within your organ, I'm not sure if you're asking within an organization, I wouldn't have a good answer for that. There's where you'll want to talk to some IT professionals, I think, on frequency for changing. I believe we're required to change our password about every 60 days here. Um, and on 
on all levels, you know, our basic login, our VPN connection, all of our accounts. Um, and we have a couple different username strings as well tied to that, those, those different passwords. Thank you for that. Does anybody else have any questions? You can submit it via chat. Um, you also have the capability of um, unmuting and uh, activating your, your camera if you would like. Any questions from anybody? I did have one kind of follow question, Michelle, which is um, when it comes to times to uh, taking stock of the information that you collect, like how often would you, do you have a recommendation for how often somebody should do that? Like should they be doing that constantly or once a yes. year? So one, one best practice would be to have your inventory list, you know, have your team and make sure there's an inventory list. And whenever you change a form and take in a new piece of information or eliminate, evaluate it against your inventory list so you can update it. Um, and, and knowing, again, when you make changes to storage, maybe you're moving something from one server to a different one, making sure you're changing that on the inventory list. Um, but then again, it's always good to audit information on a, a cycle annual is fantastic <laughs> you know um you're depending upon the volume of data that you're collecting that might need to be more frequent that might need to be less frequent um, especially if you're keeping up on maintaining your inventory but one thing any cybersecurity expert's going to tell you that takes time especially if you contact CISA you need to practice too. So knowing, it, regardless of the size of your organization, having a response team um, that might involve a communications individual, it might involve a legal, an IT expert, and someone with authority and a finance person to pay the bills and get whatever it needs procuring. But having a tabletop exercise, if you will, and practicing, if this happens, how are we going to respond? And that will help you identify gaps in your communication, in your inventory information. It may help you create a more robust procedure. And again, if you're a one person organization, a five or a 45, this still becomes a really valuable exercise. And I, I understand it's about the time um, in doing it, but it, it, it can go a long way in saving you money. Thank you for that. Does anybody else have any questions? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and leave it at that and uh, give folks uh, seven minutes back of their time. So um, thank you, Michelle, very much for, uh, for sharing that information with us today. And um, if, um, as a reminder to the folks who are on this, um, we will send out a copy of the presentation and uh, links to a recording of this webinar to you afterward. And we'll also be making it available on our uh, DOA social media channel. So again, I wanna thank you, Michelle, for all of your work on this, as well as GATCAP. And want to wish everybody a good day. And uh, if you get a chance, please take a look and uh, think about uh, going to the Cybersecurity Summit next week. So thank you, everybody. Thank Have you. a good day. Bye-bye.